Michael Jackson was one of the greatest singers of all time, but he was actually really bad with money. But he made one amazing investment. In 1985, Michael Jackson placed a $47.5 million bid that ended up winning the publishing rights to the Beatles' catalog of music. Seven years after he died, the catalog was valued at $750 million. Thanks for opening up the toolkit. I'm Justin Fortier. And today, I'm bringing on a guest, Josh Gruss, who can help explain how this whole complicated network of music publishing rights works. He's the founder, CEO, and chairman of Roundhill Music, a private equity firm that's been investing in music rights and publishing royalties since 2012. His firm owns the publishing rights to a large swath of Elvis's catalog, music by the Goo Goo Dolls, as well as hit songs like What a Wonderful World, Fever, Under the Boardwalk, and so many others. He joined me to talk about his passion for music, how and why he founded the firm, what it takes to run a publishing business, how his firm gets more value out of their catalog by running a synchronization business, which is how music is licensed for TV and movies, and how they start investing in new music via their record label. Music intellectual property is some of the most valuable IP out there. For example, you know Spotify as a great new music tech company that allows you to stream, but Spotify's biggest expense is paying Universal Music for the rights to those songs. Or another great music IP story is Taylor Swift actually feuding with the people that owned her music, so she went out and re-recorded all her masters. Music is a really complicated space, and I'm glad Josh was able to join me to help demystify it. There's a lot of interesting things happening in the music space. For example, there's a new company called Royal, co-founded by electronic music artist Blau, and Open Door co-founder J.D. Ross. This company is going to allow people to invest in music just like record companies do. There's a lot that's going to be changing about music, but before all that changes, I want to get a clear understanding of how the traditional music industry works. So now please enjoy my conversation with Josh Gruss of Roundhill Music. When did you decide or how did you decide to go into investing in music royalties. What had led up to that? You had a financial background before. I saw Coast Guard in your bio. Mm -hmm. What stacked up to music? Yeah, there, there are a lot of things that came together. Probably starts with me starting to become obsessed with music at around the age of 12 and playing guitar. And really, in my teenage years, convinced that I wanted to be in the, the music business. I remember doing an internship when I was 16 at, at a recording studio and, and thinking that was amazing. And then I did another internship during high school at, at Sony. And then when I was at Trinity College, I did an internship at the Meadows Music Theater. I don't know what it's called now, but it was a big amphitheater in town. I did an internship at the Webster Theater. I don't know if you ever had it over I've been there. there. I went to a yeah. few shows there. Not the fanciest or, or most professionally run venues uh, by any means, but that's what Hartford had to offer for music jobs. And then I went to Berkeley College of Music for a summer while I was at Trinity, as well as the whole year after graduating Trinity. So I, I took a lot of music business classes and, and guitar classes then, and that led me to my first post-college job, which was at Atlantic Records in New York. And I spent a great year and a half or so doing that. But one day I get a phone call from one of my oldest friends, Hugh, who offered uh, me a job, or, uh, offered the role of guitarist in his band. He, he went to Duke and he had a band at Duke that did really well. And when they graduated, everyone except the guitar player decided to uh, continue on with the band and live in Boston. And so that really was my dream, what, you know, come true. I always wanted to play in a band like that. So I dropped Atlantic Records to play in a band. After about two years, the, the band fizzled out. And at that point I was like 23, 24. And I really felt the pressure to, to get a real job, so to speak. And my father came from a finance world and 
his father came from a finance world. So I, I really felt it was upon me to understand something about finance at some point. And so that's when I did like a complete shift to, to finance and worked at Bear Stearns and so on and did that for about 10 years, but then really started to miss music again. And I also was going to business school part-time. And so it got me thinking about something about business school makes me think entrepreneurially. And, and I started thinking, how can I mix finance with music? And I, saw that a lot of capital was going to pharmaceutical royalty funds. There was uh, Royalty Pharma and others that were really kicking off and, and getting into gear. And I just said to myself, if, if investors are curious about pharmaceutical royalties, then what about music royalties? And that was really it. And then when I researched the marketplace and saw that there were no private equity funds in existence dedicated to music copyright investing. I couldn't believe it actually. I was, I was, this was 2010, it wasn't that long ago. You have private equity funds for everything from real estate to infrastructure, hedge funds that specialize in this area, that area, but none dedicated to music. And that just screamed opportunity to me. And, and that's how things started. Yeah, that's interesting. And for the listeners who uh, don't understand what the music royalty is. That's when a song is made. Then there's the publishing royalties mm -hmm. for the, the, the song, like the, the yeah. lyrics and the melody. And then there's something, the actual recording of this is the sound that was recorded mm -hmm. that now people would think MP3 file or something like that. And those two get split off and you invest in the song, like the, the publishing, the written melody that could be performed a number of times, but not so much on the, like we own the, the master. The master. Mm -hmm. Right. So our job is to go and, and invest wisely in, in music copyrights, right? The intellectual property of music. And that really comes in only two forms, what you just described, publishing, which is what a songwriter generates. It's the composition. It embodies the, the lyrics, the melody, the chords of a song. Then you have the recording or otherwise known as the masters or the master. That is an artist's interpretation of a song on a recording. Mm -hmm. And the publishing is really interesting because it earns money from dozens and do dozens of different sources. Everything from when music is broadcast on radio or on television or performed live in concert, in bars and restaurants, any type of public performance is paid a royalty. You make money from streaming, from YouTube, from TikTok to Peloton. You make money in what we call synchronization licenses. That's when music is uh, applied to any type of visual media. So think of every piece of music behind your favorite movies and TV shows and video games. All that music had to be licensed at one point to be legally synchronized to the, the visual media. Um, so the list of earnings goes on and on. And because of that publishing, is very diversified as a revenue source. Mm -hmm. And it is very low risk actually because of that and not very volatile. The recordings are much more volatile. Like when in, in the Napster era, when there was a lot of piracy, you remember music went from CDs to downloads and to streaming, but there was a time in there where, you know, a lot of people were also just stealing it. Yeah. And so, so the recording side had a really rough go from about 2003 to 2014. But then since streaming came about, really took off thereafter. So we make masters like about a 20% portion of what we do, but not more than that, just because it's, we feel that the right mix that way. Yeah, that makes sense. So is that something you came to in as you were building a thesis of where should I invest in royalty? Yes. I think like now you've started a a record label more right. recently, which mm -hmm. I like to I'm 
mentally comparing more towards like venture investing. It's like earlier, sta earlier stage, maybe some later stage acts where you're, it's still being made, but there's more risk. Your yeah. business mostly is investing in proven songs where you're able to have numbers over a large number of years of saying, this is how many plays, this is when it gets reperformed. This is when it gets referenced in movies. Is, is that a right? Uh, you, you nailed it on the head. 95% of what we buy is older, time-tested, very durable copyrights, very famous songs that, that have stood the test of time, right? So whether it's songs that we own, like What a Wonderful World or Total Eclipse of the Heart or um, All By Myself or even I Want It That Way by the, the Backstreet Boys, the list goes on and on. But these are evergreen songs, we call them. They're gonna they're gonna be consistently performing year in, year out. And and then the riskier, more venture side of the business, like you said, is is betting on on brand new music. And we do some of that, but it's a smaller percentage. And when you have 95% of your business dedicated to the very steady cash flowing type music catalogs, then you, it gives you license to, to take a little bit of risk and, and do that with a small amount. That makes sense. And when you say evergreen, that term, when I was reading an article that mentioned it, it was fascinating to me. Is, is this something where you see uh, music get uptake by new generations as well? You watch something where uh, it's not just the people who started listening to Elvis always listen to Elvis. It, it's do you actually see people in their 20s when they turn 30 they actually start listening to that is that part of the analysis or what does it mean to be yeah. evergreen it just means that the relevancy and the the consumption of the music has a long shelf life and you mentioned elvis you won't necessarily see elvis on the top of the billboard 100 this week sitting next to justin bieber or something but people are aware of elvis through, you know, having his music be in commercials, or maybe it's in a new movie that they just saw, or a new television show they, they just saw. Maybe it's, you know, there's a Elvis Peloton class that they took, or yeah. maybe it's just from walking around in life, like elevator music, or just music in the background of places you go, you pick up on it, maybe you shazammed it and all those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's what I mean by longer shelf life. And within rock category, if you look at the statistics, rock music, people still listen to rock from like the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Not so many people are listening to R&B and hip hop from like decades that go that far back or even pop. Um, so for us, rock is our favorite category because in our mind, the most uh, durable and has, has the longest shelf life. Think of like Bohemian Rhapsody, Queen. Like that's one of the top streaming songs and that's it's a rock song from the 70s. Yeah, and back to the Elvis briefly before I continue, just in preparation for this, I, I went on uh, Spotify and looked 25 million plays a month on mm -hmm. Spotify, which is in line with maybe not radio worthy. Yeah. That's that's yeah, yeah. radio play uh, worthy and just very yeah. quietly getting yeah. a massive artist of today. So that, yeah. that was mean, surprising. You know, there, there's there are weird pockets around the world of, of Elvis freaks, right? I remember when I, and this is a long time ago now, but after graduating Trinity, I went with my one of my classmates on a trip to Sweden and we rent, rented a, a camper van and went kayaking in, in the north of Sweden. And as we're like trying to find this river and driving on some non-paved forest road in the middle of nowhere, we came across all these people with 1950s American cars and like pompadours. And it was like a surreal scene out of nowhere, there was just like this Elvis convention in the woods <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. And in some places around the world, they just still are infatuated with that dude. So that's a good example, actually. 
that's that makes sense and so on the rock concerts or rock concerts fall into something where if you have the copyright that is something where you'd get a royalty from that or is yeah. that okay yeah. so those you acts get, are and pouring and it's, it's, into their it's 80s. how it works and, and it's not a, a large amount in the u.s around a little less than one percent of Ticket sales goes to pay the songs on the set list. In other countries, it can be a lot more. Like in Argentina, it's 12% of, of ticket office or box office. Wow. So if you're, if you own Rolling Stones is publishing and they're touring Argentina, like you probably want to double check that you got paid correctly on that. But so this is how it works. You play a show at Madison Square Garden. Um, your manager is going to submit the set list to someone at, at Madison Square Garden. They're going to take that and submit it to ASCAP and BMI. We're going to make sure it gets paid that way. And like in one of our catalogs, for example, which is a former guitarist from the band Kiss, this guy, Vinnie Vincent, because he wrote, you know, three or four songs that Kiss pretty much every concert they play these songs. When Kiss goes on tour, it meaningfully affects the, the level of income from this one catalog. Yeah. Yeah. So is that a factor in investment decisions if the band's still touring or something like that? Because yeah. you get yeah. I mean, extra push. If Kiss was about to hang it up and retire and, and not play anymore, and a good portion of the catalog came from these live concerts, then you want to discount for that. Hmm. And you mentioned ASCAP and BMI. Those are organizations that follow up to make sure people get paid appropriately. Is it, yeah. Are they the major players in that space where your firm has a good chunk dedicated to what looks like administrative, uh, like royalty collection and stuff? Mm -hmm. what, what's being handled by those? Uh, yeah two things you named and what's being handled yeah. by your firm? Great question. ASCAP and BMI are what we call performing rights organizations, PROs, and they handle all of what we call the performance royalty category. So anything having to do with performance royalties in the U.S., is going to go through ASCAP and BMI. And there's actually two others. There's CSAC and another one called GMR, but they're much smaller. And interestingly enough, ASCAP and BMI were founded a really long time ago. ASCAP is about 110 years old and BMI about 85 years old. So they've been around a really long time. And what they do is they're the ones who monitor all the radio stations, all the television stations. If you go to ASCAP or BMI's headquarters in Nashville, you'll find whole office floors full of people whose job it is to call all the bars and restaurants across the whole country, basically. Roller rinks, gyms, any type of public business, sorry, business that plays music in a public way. Um, they're calling up and making sure that they're licensed. So you think about that, it's a lot of work. They have hundreds and hundreds of people. It makes it a lot easier on our industry to have them do all that heavy lifting on behalf of the whole industry, as opposed to Round Hill and each individual publisher having to um, go out and license like thousands of different groups like that. It'd be actually impossible to do. On a radio station or a bar or a restaurant, you only have to go to two or three groups to get fully licensed as opposed to going to like hundreds of different publishers to make sure your, your butt's covered. So it, it works really well for both sides, if that makes sense. Yeah, so your administrative team is mostly making sure that 
your records and your music is appropriately filed with those two organizations. That's right. And then maybe doing periodic audits of whatever you think should be the the highest earning or any place like Argentina, you said, maybe they'll go back and they'll check Argentina yeah. extra close to make sure that. Exactly. Okay. And then the, our royalty and admin people are also directly collecting other types of royalties that are not performance, like mechanical royalties and synchronization royalties and other royalties. And also for every country around the world, there's a local ASCAP or BMI type of society. So we're making sure all of our songs are registered across the whole global society network. And there's a lot to it. Yeah. It's a pretty complex ecosystem, the whole music publishing royalty world. And a lot of people have a hard time grasping how it works. And even after doing this for 10 years, I'm still learning some aspects about it myself. As things have gotten more advanced on the software side, are there any tools that are I guess, used that, that allow for much easier administration that are an industry standard or does your firm have to develop any sort of proprietary software? I see you have a CTO. What does that entail on your end? Yeah, there's definitely some efficiency. So for example, um, there's something called uh, CWR, which is like a, a common like f- Excel format for how you deliver songs mm-hmm. information to all these different parties so that you can have a master list and just kind of send it off a lots of different groups in the industry and they can suck it in and, and ingest it and, and get the, the tap flowing, so to speak. That being said, in general, though, the, the ecosystem is pretty antiquated still. And there's talk about blockchain and all sorts of other things that could make the whole network run a lot more efficiently, but we just haven't seen that happen yet. Real basic stuff, like in Europe, like I mentioned, there's there's a society in every country. And in the UK, they have PRS. In France, it's SASEM. In Switzerland, it's Suisa. In Germany, it's GEMA. And these are, like ASCAP and, and, and BMI, these are institutions that have been there for a long time. So they're embedded locally, but what if you just had one European society Uh and you took out all those different layers of costs, just something as simple as that in this modern day and age we haven't seen happen yet. Yeah. So there's plenty of room for organizational improvements before any sort of uh, technological revolution. (laughs) Yeah. And the Spanish society was a couple of years ago, like the just the discovery was completely corrupt and, 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 you know, a lot of weird hands in the pot and, and like in Italy, I'm sure in some of these societies, like the, the CEO drives around in like a chauffeured limousine all day. You know what I mean? Like yeah. those kind of things are culturally still locked in. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and even just thinking about the, what has to happen when every time a song gets made, gets split up, there's a million piece or yes. not, t- at least 10 <laughs> or something like that yeah. of so, all I mean, the different people point, involved. Like, you, you have to be really proactive to th- these societies. They work for everybody. Like, and it's up to you as a publisher to be on top of them and be proactive to make sure that they're doing a good job. Yeah. Is that relationship building or is that uh, more auditing? I think it's both. Mm-hmm. So on the mechanical royalty, you mentioned mm-hmm. for a while, the music industry was very profitable because of CDs and vinyl right. before that you have more classic evergreen catalog. Do, do you still is our CDs are, are still a, a portion that you guys see? Are people buying CDs anywhere or any more of those or is most of it still through streaming in terms of people actually playing your songs? not live or any of the other things you mentioned. Yeah, so a better place to look at that is on the the master recording side to Uh see what percentage of your income is still coming from physical product. And for us and for the industry as a whole, it's not a lot at this point. It's maybe down to about 10% um, still comes from physical product. Vinyl, I think, is eclipsed the CD in, in that category. And unbelievably, the vinyl business has 
grown by strong double digit growth every year for the last six or seven years. And, and I, I think in 2020, it grew by 48%. So, so people love vinyl. CDs definitely dying out in the US for sure, but in places like Japan, um, believe it or not, there's still a very strong CD culture and in Germany as well. So there, there are pockets in the world where people are still buying CDs. Mm-hmm. Was it 2017 you acquired Zinc? Yeah. The synchronization company. Yep. And I see that's based in LA. Their job is to help get things placed in TV and movies, correct? Yep. And is that a relationship business or is that something where are they building, like when a new movie comes up, are they trying to see when's that movie set? Is it set in the fifties? Let's go push some of this. Is it set in the eighties? Let's, we know that these are our like uh, high point or songs of the decade. Can, can we make sure that's in there? Is, is that kind of what's happening or is that more administrative? No, it, it's definitely along the lines of what you were just saying. Um, so synchronization hap- happens really in two worlds, in the film and TV world, which mm-hmm. is very Los Angeles based. And then the advertising world, which is more New York based. Chicago and, and other cities have big Adver- advertising firms. So we, we have a group of people that sit in LA that handle the film and TV world, and then some in New York that handle the advertising world. And what they're basically doing is they have a number of clients they interact with on a regular basis, and they, they help them find the right piece of music for their project that they're working on. Yeah, maybe it is a movie about the 80s, and someone, the music supervisor for that movie or TV show will reach out to someone at Zinc for some suggestions. And then it's up to them to look through Round Hill's repertoire and kind of make a few good suggestions. And the ultimate goal is to is, is to have them choose your song for, for an opportunity. A lot of the times the music supervisor might already know what song they want to use. And it's in that on, with that example, sync licensing is, is less about the sort of creative, uh, let me call it, uh, out, outward facing angle of Zinc, but more on the just back end sync licensing. If someone already knows what song they want, they're just going to call up our licensing department and they'll negotiate it. But we do have about 15 people who are on that outward facing creative front end and They just do an amazing job. Um, I'll just give you a quick stat that still blows my mind, which is before Round Hill bought Zinc, over the course of 10 years, Zinc generated over $100 million in synchronization revenue for their clients. And that just blows my mind because the repertoire that they represented back then did not include any evergreen catalog songs, right? That their clients were very new, trending, cutting edge artists that most people had never heard of, which means in order for them to generate a hundred million dollars, they had to really hustle for that. They weren't just like picking up the phone, signing licenses for What a Wonderful World or something. and, and so they continue to be able to generate that same type of revenue, like around $10 million a year um, for mostly kind of more cutting edge, newer music. Uh-huh. And, and that, that just blows my mind. And what we do to take advantage of that is we get those trending, more current artists to do re-records or cover versions of some of our older catalog songs. Uh-huh. And then all of a sudden the older catalog song gets brought back to life in a, in an interesting way. That really, that acquisition really makes sense now looking at, so that's a way for you to take an energetic team and Mm -hmm. then combine that with your 
massive catalog that you're putting yeah. together and extend the life is in compared to streaming, where does synchronization fall in terms of re- revenues? Synchronization for the industry or you yeah. for, for all of publishing is usually around 25% of the entire business. And I think for us, it might be 30% or something of our revenue. It's growing because think about all the content creation on Apple, on Amazon, on Hulu, on Netflix. Each one of those companies is spending over $10 million a year or so on new content. And all that needs music. And Mm -hmm. If it's a show like, was it Amazing Mrs. Maisel, Mizell? Yeah. I might be screwing up that title. But that's like a period piece, right? That That's maybe like 1930s, 1940s type music. A lot of these programs might need music from a certain decade. And Round Hill has music basically across every decade that we can, a full sales bag for any of those situations. Yeah. Do you find that the relationships... Marvelous, because... Mrs. Maisel. Sorry, not amazing, Mrs. Maisel. <laughs> As your content yeah. library grows, is do you feel that the relationships become easier to sell? Like each additional... Now that people know Roundhill has this, people know that Zinc has access to that. Has that allowed them to forge new relationships in terms of the service business as well? Um, or as do you focus more on serving your own Round Hill's needs? I think we've been very careful to, because when Round Hill acquired Zinc, we didn't want to ruin the great thing that they had already established, which is being a tastemaker. Like people trusted their taste Mm. and we didn't want to be that company that just sends out emails like, here's the song of the week from the catalog. So they are very careful not to lose that sort of tastemaker aspect of what they had. That's why we still use the brand name Zinc at the front, because without that, then we'd just be roundhill and maybe people would just view us as a catalog only type of situation. That being said, there's definitely synergy there because they never had catalog to sell before. So now opens up the doors for tons of opportunities for them to pitch to. Yeah. In one of your interviews with Music Business Worldwide, I saw that you were talking about the service providers that could potentially service your catalog. Right. You have some of that in-house. Right. And you were saying that there's some tension in between how how much focus are you getting from whoever's serving you? Uh, How do you decide to balance that with your own service businesses at Round Hill? and zinc and things like that. How do you say, when do we focus internally? When do we focus externally? How do we operate both businesses? That's such an amazing question. Um, That whole decision tree, if you will, of what to insource, what to outsource, definitely a major factor for for any music publisher. And from the very beginning, Roundhill, wanted to do it ourselves because we we wanted to be able to be able to add value to these catalogs and and, and really mean that and and be able to follow through with that. There's a lot of competition for us that they have the checkbook, they can buy catalogs, no problem. But in terms of what they do with that catalog after they own it, they might say, oh, you know, we're going to use our relationships. No, KKR came out today. You know, I've seen other kind of like purely financial groups enter into the space. And I just don't see beyond being a checkbook, what their capabilities are going to be for servicing the, the catalog. So Roundhill, we administer our own catalog for all the territories except for secondary type territories in, in Europe and in Asia and Africa and South America, we outsource it to Warner Chapel. And that's pretty much what any smaller size publisher has to do um, until it becomes large enough to be able to afford having an office in Hong Kong and in Berlin, in Paris. We have offices in, in London 
Nashville, LA, and New York at the moment. And we handle Scandinavia directly, but we don't have an office there. Um, my point is that as you grow, you're going to start insourcing more of that sub-publishing network, as we call it. A Roundhill can't be a Sony with an office in every country. It just doesn't make financial sense. So that on that sort of very basic level, that's the major insource versus outsource split that we have. Yeah. It's some people will come to you for services or is that only on Zinc? They come to us for admin services that could be just for Zinc. Like we would call those Zinc only representation deals, but more often it's handling their publishing overall. Interesting. And so the thing that's, I saved for last and we'll get you off before five is investment decisions. I know on the front end, there's A&R and at a label who's listening to new music or maybe the bigger labels, they're seeing what's popping on Instagram or SoundCloud, things like that. I I don't know exactly how it works, but how do you make these uh, investment decisions? Is it an investment committee? Um, What does that look like for Roundhill? We have an investment committee. We source a ton of deals. We probably only do about, only close on maybe 10% of all the deals we look at. The easiest first step to deciding whether to move forward is, is just what are you selling in terms of music? Are you, are you like, what are the songs that you're selling and what is the quality of that? So if it's, um, if it's younger music from the last five years or so, it's, it's almost 99% it's going to be a pass because for us, we just don't like buying into that risk of the newer income streams. It, it, were they big hits? Were they A class, B class, C class type songs? A lot of the times they're they're in the sort of C to D category, and we're just it just doesn't meet the quality that we're looking for. And quality means like, was it a number one song? Was it a top ten song? Was it a hit just in the U.S. or was it a hit all around the world? Is the song embedded in lots of movies and TV shows? If it's we bought Eddie Holland's catalog in Fun One. That's 20 number one hits from the Motown era, like Stop in the Name of Love and You Can't Hurry Love. Those songs are known globally. They're in literally thousands of movies and TV shows. And uh, you will just not find a better sort of culturally relevant catalog like that. That's just an example of kind of a, a no-brainer from a quality perspective. But after that, it it turns to, do you have administrative control? That's a big deal. Obviously, the valuation is a huge deal. Then other things like, is the legal due diligence sound? Is there some legal hair on this catalog for some reason? Are there any reversions of these rights that might be coming up? Um, Has there ever been someone that's come out of the woodwork and you know claimed that they wrote the song or things like that. We've had several deals fall apart once we discover those kinds of situations. It, it all plays out, but we, we've done over a hundred deals and we just really know what to look for and how to get through the process. Yeah, that makes sense. The, so with a lot of proof points, it's easier to see what quality means. It's not people bickering over whether it just simply sounds good. <laughs> um, well, there's a list of that Rolling Stone magazine has of the 500 greatest songs of all time. And about 10% of that list we own. So that helps us. Just that statistic probably means that we're qualitatively in the right place. Uh-huh. And on that quality and what you do with it, what are you discussing strategies of what we would do with this song? Or is it basically like we know how to operate in the music space? We know we can continue to drive, help this song appear in the ways that it has performed. Mm -hmm. Or are you ever saying 
this is a catalog. We think that it's been mismanaged. We can do a turnaround or are you mostly just saying this is strong. We know how to operate strong catalogs. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a, a high quality catalog that you just need to continue operating how, you know, level that it has in the past. Getting our input from the sync team is important. And sometimes they say, there's not much we can do with this sync wise. And other times they say this would work great for sync. And we think we can do a lot with it. That factors in, but sometimes, sometimes music is not syncable at all. It's just not going to have the right messaging in the lyrics. Maybe one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of hip hop and rap is that, is that no one can really license a song with, with bad words in it, right? Or at least for ads and things. So that, that takes away from some of the opportunities, but like with our master recordings, the, the idea there is not really synchronization. It's just let's own things that are going to make a lot of money from streaming. So synchronization doesn't have to be part of the thought process on every deal. Yeah. I, I spoke with a data analyst at Universal Music yeah. and he was talking about some of the things that they would do to, try, since they're mostly working with new music, extend the arc of songs to prevent them from just kind of dropping off and uh -huh. playlists, things on Spotify, trying yeah. to find ways to promote there. Is that capabilities that you guys are working on at Round Hill? Or? I think that's something that, that the record companies are definitely working on. I think that with music discovery platforms like TikTok and that song Dreams from Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. I mean, as soon as it went viral, the streams increased by, let's see, by about five times. So yeah. about 500%. And the rest of the Fleetwood Mac catalog got a big lift alongside of that because people were like, oh, I'll check out their other music. I think those types of moments are going to happen for at some point for just any, all good songs. Like mm -hmm. if, if a song is good, there's a good chance that something special will happen virally with it that way. Yeah. Over awesome. time. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot. I really appreciate your time and thank you for sharing. Yeah, you, Justin, you learned this industry pretty well. You asked some great questions. So thanks for, thanks for reaching out as a fellow Trinity alum. I, this is more special because of that. So it's awesome to connect with you. Great. Have a good rest of the day. All right. Thanks, Justin. Bye.